ನಾರಾಯಣ ನಮಸ್ಕೃತ ನರಂ ಚೈವ ನರೋತ್ತಮ ದೇವಿ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ವ್ಯಾಸ ತೋ ಜಯ ಮುದೀರೇ ಶೃಣ್ವತಾ ಸ್ವಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪುಣ್ಯಶ್ರವಣ ಕೀರ್ತನ ಹೃದಯಂತಹಸ್ತೋಹಿ ಭದ್ರಿ ವಿದೂನೋತಿ ಸುಹೃತ್ಸತ ನಷ್ಟಪ್ರಾಯು ಅಭದ್ರೇಶು ನಿತ್ಯ ಭಾಗವತ ಸೇವೆಯ ಭಗವತಿ ಉತ್ತಮ ಶ್ಲೋಕೆ ಭಕ್ತಿರ್ಭವತಿ ನೈಸ್ತಿಕಿ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಹರಿ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸೊ ವಿ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಅವರ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಶನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಥರ್ಡ್ ಕ್ಯಾಂಟೋ ಅಂಡ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ right at the beginning of chapter 18 and the previous sessions we spoke of the appearance of hiranyaksha and hiranyakashipu the twin brothers we also spoke of the beginning of the challenges that were faced by the residents of heavens and the residents of the planet as soon as there was a conception that occurred in the womb of mother diti so the conception was so powerful and these personalities were so powerfully demoniac that they had the ability to modify material nature and cause disturbances as if foretelling that there are going to be a lot more challenges once they come out of the womb so mother diti she holds on to the pregnancy for 100 years and what was astonishing to see is that the same mother diti she could not contain her urge to unite with her husband she couldn't control her urge to unite with her husband but she had such powers of tapasya that she could hold on to the pregnancy for 100 years because she knew that her progeny could cause disturbance so it's quite fascinating to see that the time factor which is a supreme time factor is so powerful and no matter how overwhelmingly powerful someone might be as a tapaswini no matter how high a birth might be no matter you know how qualified one may be in the science the subtle science of being able to manage material nature the time factor is so powerful that there are events that are just practically imposed upon one based on the time factor you can't just control so the supreme lord in this feature of time in the material world so powerful so that is being witnessed because she was so powerful that she could hold on to this pregnancy but she was not powerful enough to contain her urges to unite with her husband at an inappropriate time even though she was the wife of a rishi she practically knew what was forbidden and what was allowed so it was quite fascinating to see the power of the time factor and then what is also very important is the fact that krishna practically parleys he practically has extended conversations with the kumaras who are also impelled by time because they were a part of material nature they were impelled by time even though they were extraordinarily elevated they were impelled by time which is krishna himself to actually become angry and be provoked by jaya and vijaya and curse jaya and vijaya to be born as demons and jaya and vijaya they are exalted servants of lord vishnu and they are in vaikuntha they also are being impelled by the time factor to actually misbehave and stop the rishis from the kumaras from advancing and meeting lord vishnu so it was practically in one sense the time factor is so powerful that it's almost like moving coins on a chessboard one coin is moved against the other by a, an expert player and the coins are inert they don't have the ability to take a decision who ever picks them up and who is playing they can pick up a pawn or a horse or an elephant you know the bishop whatever we call it they can just practically move the chess coins in any which way they want in one sense because our senses are somewhat in touch with material nature material nature and those who control material nature and in reality the supreme time factor who is the controller of everything they have the ability to practically manipulate and change things and move things forward 
So Lord Narasimha, when he appears to annihilate Hiranyakashipu, he basically is worshipped as Mahakala himself. He is practically Maharudra. He is Maharudra. You know, he's, he's celebrated as Maharudra because he is considered to be the origin of Rudra. The concept of Rudra is Lord Shiva. He is the origin of Lord Shiva. He is Mahakala. He is practically the origin of Lord Shiva because Lord Shiva is Kala. He is practically the time factor. You see, he and Mother Parvati, they control the time. They practically are material time. They control the concept of material time. Lord Narasimha is the origin of Lord Shiva, which means that basically they carry a lot of characteristics and Lord Shiva is the greatest servant of Lord Narasimha. Um, in Ahobilam, in South India, in the, as you enter the altar of Jwala Narasimha, who is not Jwala Narasimha, Jwala Narasimha is the Narasimha Dev deity right at the top of the mountain. But then there is um, uh, Ahobila Narasimha. There is a Narasimha Dev deity who is considered to be the main deity in the hill. And as you enter the deity's sanctum, everything is carved into boulders. You see, if you're, some of you have been there, you practically are looking at an altar, which is a space between two boulders. And you're walking through carvings. You're practically walking through a mountain. That's what you're experiencing. And as you walk through, there's an altar before Nasimadev, and there is a very, very big shivling right at the lotus feet of Nasimadev. So indicating that Lord Shiva, who is considered the Mahabhagavat, the Param Vaishnav, is indeed the greatest worshipper of Narasimadev. Yeah. His main deity is not Narasimadev. Uh, Ugra Narasimha, very specifically, as Sankarsana. Yeah, he worships Shankarsana, Shankarsana Rupa, which is basically Balaram's Rupa of challenging the false ego of living entities, is Ugra Narasimha. The more peaceful Lakshmi Narasimha Dev is the Vasudev Murti. So even the four quadruple forms, they represent themselves as deities and different deities are different manifestations of the quadruple form. And Sankarsana, whenever the Lord picks up weapons, to subdue the false ego of a living entity, to subdue the material nature which is within and overpowered the living entities, then you have to understand that he is in the mood of Sankarsana. Lord Ram picks up a weapon, he is Sankarsana. Lord Ram sits with Mother Sita on the throne, he is Vasudeva Murti. Yeah, amongst the Vasudeva, Sankarsan, Anirudh Pradyumna, the quadruple expansion. This is tattva. This is basically how the, there's a differentiation between the mood of the deities and then there is a differentiation and representation of who they are. So we hear that one should not worship Ukrana Simadev if especially one is not ready for all the challenges. Challenges of actually seeing uh, material nature being subdued by him constantly. So there'll be constant changes one has to cope with. The ashram will change. This will change, that will change. You practically will have to be coping with massive changes because the Lord, being extraordinarily merciful, wants to subdue the false ego within us and make us powerfully efficient in service. As a consequence, when the false ego is being challenged, then you also have the external environment being challenged. So relationships would face challenges. Then the financial situation, economics would face challenges. Then you would have physical challenges to some level. So all kinds of challenges come because this false ego is being subdued by the Sankarsana Rupa. This is Ugrana Simamurti. So that's why sannyasis who travel once in three days, they are, they are meant to travel quite a bit. And in Iskon sannyasis, they travel more than any other sannyasi does. Yeah, because they're constantly traveling from one country to another, being exposed to material nature in a very profound way, unusually profound way. And as they travel, then they can worship because the Lord basically is subjecting them to changes. He is constantly wanting them to surrender. And then they're also put constantly in positions of surrender. So Ugrana Simhadev can be worshipped. But then Lakshmi Simha is the deity to be worshipped in families. Very specifically, after there is some advice that is received from senior Vaishnavas. The Narasimhadev deities, you have to be careful in terms of worship. Because the expectation of surrender is quite intense by the Lord. And as a consequence, 
the worship itself should be sanctioned so that the devotee can cope with all the changes that can come along with the wonderful worship standard that the Lord will demand and ask for. But it is one of the most amazing, amazing representations of the Supreme Lord. And Lord Varaha and Lord Narasimha are factually the same because they deal with twin brothers and twins, they carry characteristics. They carry characteristics which are almost identical. So in features and also in terms of what kind of attitude, so on and so forth, the physical environment specifically will remain the same. Um, needless to say, there can be changes. There can be changes and there can be a change or rather a different kind of life um, at different times by these twins, uh, for twins. But then it doesn't mean that um, a lot of things would change. The physical environment, appearance, obviously, and uh, propensities in certain ways, they will all remain the same. But then there would be quite a few changes that would be, you know, there would be certain manifestations that can be different as well. And that's also extraordinarily karmic. So Narasimhadev and Urahadev, they are also considered to be the same. By the, the worshippers in Ahubilam, they consider them the same. Now, the chapter that's going to come forward has certain extraordinarily powerful, powerful messages. Chapter 18. The message which was quite, there were messages which were quite profound was the fact that Krishna is so personal. And even as devotees, we carry characteristics of impersonalism because impersonalism in one sense is I would say a preliminary characteristic. Bhakti comes after love and after surrender. So there's to be love and then there's surrender. But then impersonalism of wanting to approach the deity for the purpose of purification, wanting to approach the deity purely for the purpose of serving him, for the purpose of attaining or being, you know, attaining some kind of relief so that one could escape the material world. Um, these, are, these are all situations where one can carry potentially one can carry impersonal views. Impersonal views, not necessarily philosophically, because philosophically, deeply, not many of us have understood the differences, but more so in terms of dealing with Krishna. So here in this chapter, we find that Hiranyaksha is actually insulting Krishna. He's calling him names. He's deriding him. He's practically calling him a fool. He's calling him a muda. He's calling Varahadev names. And the next verse in this chapter talks of how Lord Varaha is actually expressing, experiencing pain. He is actually experiencing pain due to the sharp words that is coming forth from this demoniac personality. So this is quite unusual because in one sense, we would think Krishna is not supposed to experience anything. He's transcendentally situated. The devotees are transcendentally situated, pure devotees. They don't experience pain. Srila Haridas Thakur did not experience pain when he was beaten in so many different marketplaces when he was beaten. Haridas Thakur did not experience pain. So there is an understanding that as we become transcendentally situated, the physical body can't influence the mind because the suffering aspect of life is a phenomenon of the mind. It is not so much physical is what happens to the mind due to a certain change, either physically or in the environment, that is considered great suffering. So if one has conquered and one has gone above the mind, how do we know if something has gone above the mind? The mind united with false ego in the mode of goodness. So if one is able to transcend and reach pure goodness, which is untouched by passion and ignorance. Nashta prayeshu abhadreshu. Nashta prayeshu abhadreshu. If one is able to reach the platform of transcendental goodness, then one understands that such a person is beyond the experience of pain because the mind um, is situated in transcendental goodness. There is no such thing as an attachment to the body. There, the mind can't experience it. So they are practically situated in a transcendental platform. So we have to understand that there isn't suffering we have to distinguish the two. Uh, there may be a lot of pain. Srila Haridas Thakur was beaten so badly that his bones were bad, his skin was torn, and he was dragged through 22 different marketplaces 
and he was practically beaten to death, literally. So you can imagine that, you know, he's such a gentle person who was practically fasting and, you know, chanting Harinam. He was dragged through all these marketplaces. So Shastra says he did not experience any pain. He did not suffer. In reality, uh, sorry, he did not suffer. The pain was absorbed by Mahaprabhu. But in reality, one can be in pain and not suffer. So that's the transcendental situation. Because being in the material body essentially means we will be exposed to pain. Being in the material world, a guarantee is that the environment is going to change. And as a consequence, we will experience some kind of pain. Now, are we going to suffer on account of pain or are we going to be beyond suffering? That is the transcendental situation. If one has freed the mind from the influence of passion and ignorance, then even though there is pain, one doesn't experience any suffering because he's beyond suffering. The mind does not experience suffering. So the physical body may not give of trouble. The physical body may stay good, but then the mind can continue suffering if someone something goes wrong with us. So someone might suffer through some kind of an issue where the issue is long gone, but they're still suffering. So in a similar fashion, one's physical body could heal or rather it could recover from disease, but then the mind is still continuing to suffer. It's continuing to suffer. So there's a distinction between pain and suffering. So the point we want to make here is that we want to understand that being transcendental means there can be pain, but there's no suffering. But then what is astonishing in this chapter is that Lord Varaha is actually pained by this very vile low-class words which are being uttered by Hiranyaksha. He's actually in pain. So then we have an understanding. He is in pain because in this Hiranyaksha, he is seeing his servant Vijaya. He's seeing Jaya and Vijaya and Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu. So he's practically seeing his servants in these two personalities. It was not just a demon. If it was just a demon, then there would just be fury. There would be anger. There's pain on account of someone who is very dear to the Lord because the Lord is able to see that this demon is conditioned. He's forgotten his position. He is thinking that he is this body. He's thinking he is a demon. But then this is my dear servant. Yeah. So this Jaya and Vijaya, when the Lord is viewing Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha, he is viewing Jaya and Vijaya. And as a consequence, when Hiranyaksha is hurling, um, you know, and uttering abuses, and he's very uh, insulting towards Lord Varaha, Lord Varaha is experiencing pain because there is some wonder. And Krishna is so personal. This, is, this shows that even in a circumstance of this kind, Krishna is so personal that he experiences a pain because he loves the person who is conditioned. Even though he is conditioned, he loves this Hiranyaksha at a different level because of the fact that he is a dear servant who has come down and he's become overpowered by material nature. But then he practically suffers on account of Krishna is experiencing pain because now this is a relationship. This is a very deep relationship. So he's going through pain. And you can see the depth of the relationship. He's practically petitioning the Kumaras to reduce the size of the curse. He is practically telling them that, you know, I have done you wrong. It is not these two. It is I who have wrong. Because when the master, you know, when the servants insult great personalities such as yourself, they commit offenses. The master is to blame because I am to blame. So Krishna is actually experiencing and experiencing trauma at the words and the anger, the the general behavior of his servants. And then you see here as to how personal he is that when he's fighting, he's practically experiencing uh, pain on account of the extraordinarily poor words that are being uttered by Hiranyaksha. I was talking to someone a couple of days back. I was telling them how there is a temple in Southern India of Garuda, Lord Garuda. And this is in Kumbakonam. If those of you are familiar and have visited Kumbakonam, it's a wonderful place. It's actually surcharged with all kinds of pastimes and temples and so on. And there is a temple of Lord Garuda. And this is the only temple where Lord Garuda has his own massive altar. Because the deity is made of stone. He is around seven feet. And he is stone, 
And you have seen this Garuda Vahana in different temples in South India where they make him of wood and then the deity is made to sit on top of Garuda and then they're taken out on procession. The deity of Garuda is made of wood. The deity is wood covered by metal, etc. But then this is an unusual place where the deity of Garuda who is seven feet is massive. He is massive. He is made of stone. And he is also used as a palanquin. What is unusual is that on two occasions in the year, there are festivals held in the temple and four priests would pick up this extraordinarily large stone deity who weighs almost a ton. Four priests would pick him up. The priests wouldn't be sweating. It is said, and it is a real account, it is happening even as of today. The deity of Garuda would start sweating. <laughs> Four priests would pick up a deity who is worth, you know, who is weighing a ton. They would bring him out of the sanctum. As they bring him out of the sanctum and they take a few steps, the four priests now would need to become eight priests because the deity would have become heavier. They would walk a few more steps. Then the four priests would have to become eight. The eight priests would have to become 16. They'll walk a few more steps. The 16 priests have to become 32 because the Lord would become heavier. Then I will walk a few more steps. These 32 priests would become um, uh, 64. The 32 priests would become 64. So it's quite unusual to see that by the time they place this Garuda deity under the pandal for you know, the celebration, four priests would have picked him up and then he would have sweated. There's a little sweating that occurs on the face of the deity because he's putting effort in lifting himself up because only four people are lifting him. And then he brings, and then this becomes 64. What is unusual is that as they take the deity back, the 64 becomes 32. As they reach the altar, 32 becomes 16, 16 becomes eight priests who are carrying the deity. And then eight priests become again four who place the deity back into the altar. Yeah? And this is happening as of today. It's not an ancient tale which is, I'm wanting to share this because this is an extraordinarily personal account of deities in our temples and how personal they are and how much of an expression of, I would say, um, exchange of, I would say, uh, dealings with devotees happen in these temples in different places of India, you know, depending on how deeply they're worshipped and how well they're worshipped. And this is quite fascinating to see that Krishna, he is so personal. So there's a, such a personal interaction where he is demonstrating and he's giving faith to the devotees there. In a similar fashion, we see in this chapter about Lord Varaha, where even though his form is gigantic and he is beginning to start a battle with Hiranyaksha, he is actually being pained. He is carrying some pain because of the sharp words that come from the demon. And that's because this Hiranyaksha was a dear servant and he couldn't really overcome that particular relationship. So Krishna is fighting with this Hiranyaksha to expose or rather have a moment of chivalry. He's practically, basically being uh, what I would call as experiencing the idea of wanting to be in battle. That's also a source of pleasure for Krishna. But at the same time, when there's some very sharp words which are unusual that are being uttered, he's seeing his servant and he's feeling pain. So we hear in this chapter about how personal the exchanges between the Lord, even if the circumstances are adverse and how Krishna, who despite being transcendently situated, because we have this particular notion that he should feel, he should have no feelings because he's a deity or Krishna, you know, how would he know anything? But in reality, he has so many feelings, just like us, you know, he has feelings. And he is expressing those feelings. Shastra is accounting for it. So Lord Srila Vyasadeva has written this yeah, in Srimad Bhagavatam that Krishna is having feelings. So this particular feelings of Lord Varaha is also experienced by the deities in our temples. They are experienced by the deities. So it's a matter of us being able to approach the deity um, of Krishna and Radharani and the other deities we have in our temples. The more personal we are, greater would be the experience. The more personal we are 
in terms of understanding that Krishna is a person and he needs to be fed, he needs to be cared for, he needs to be taken care of, then there is a greater level of reciprocation. And there is a lesser level of reciprocation if the relationship becomes impersonal. Impersonal where we are worshipping for the purpose of purity, we are worshipping for the purpose of you know, purifying ourselves and as a consequence, we are really not very keen on relationships, but then we want to be purified because we don't want to suffer. We want our mind to be purified and reach the position of pure goodness so that it doesn't suffer because it has come in touch with false ego and the whole impression of false ego occurs in the mode of goodness, which is contaminated by passion and ignorance. But as we get relieved from this particular position, then the suffering ceases. Even if there are instances of pain, one doesn't really suffer. So it's quite astonishing to find Lord Varaha in pain when Hiranyaksha is actually insulting him. And this is quite fascinating. Um, and it is just basically an account of how personal Krishna consciousness is, how personal Srimad Bhagavatam is. It is actually exposing Srimad Bhagavatam because it's dynamic. It is Krishna himself in the literary form is actually exposing his emotions. You know, we are very going very deep into the emotions of the Lord. And, it, and this is very unusual because we want to understand it from that perspective. It's very unusual because we only hear of him slaying Hiranyaksha. We hear of Nasimadev tearing apart Hiranyaksha. Nasimadev did something wonderful too. I mean, in a sense, uh, I meant to say from the perspective of very different. Um, when he killed Hiranyaksha, he practically sat on the throne, which he had never done for any demon. And uh, the opinion of our Acharyas, the opinion of a Gurujan is the fact that he sat on the throne of Hiranyakashipu because Hiranyakashipu was a devotee. There was Sambandha. Because there was Sambandha, Lord Narasimhadeva accepted that particular situation and sat on the throne after killing Hiranyakashipu. And then after taking over the kingdom, he handed it to his dear servant, Srila Sri Prahlad Maharaj. And he also wanted to show Prahlad that I have killed your father. So as a consequence, I am now your father. So he practically sits and then gives that particular impression. So he wants to play the role of a father because he's fully aware that that relationship is lost for Prahlad. And he's fully aware that he's a little boy. He's seven years old, um, you know, and he needs the relationship. So he needs to be given that relationship. So he's practically proxying and taking the place of Hiranyakashipu and extending that particular relationship. So Mother Lakshmi, Mother Lakshmi, the concert of Lord Narasimha and Lord Narasimha himself, they play that role with the devotees. They practically play the role of father and mother. So that's the role they play because that's the mood of Narasimha, Lakshmi Narasimha. They are practically that particular position. You know, he experiences the mood of wanting to be a father because he has just killed the father of his devotee. So he wants to practically proxy him so that he doesn't feel that vacuum in the relationship. He practically fills in. So Krishna is so personal. He's so personal with every dealing with the devotees. He's so personal. We hear that one needs to fall in love with Krishna for us to be able to surrender. And then one needs to be surrendered for us to be able to render service, which is bhakti. Bhakti is service. Then one wonders, what is this concept of love? Why should I be in love? Yeah, why should I be in love? Uh, we should experience Krishna Prema. We should experience Krishna Prema and we should fall in love with Krishna so that we can understand his love for us. So this is quite unusual because we have no idea as to how intensely he loves us. We have no idea as to how personal this particular relationship is and how proximate he feels we are to him and to his heart. We have no idea because we come from very impersonal um, uh, circumstances. We come from very impersonal circumstances. And as a consequence, we somehow or the other tend to even treat the opportunity of the Archavigraha, treat the opportunity of the deity, treat the opportunity of even worshipping the deity, etc., with certain level of, I would say, um, you know, impersonalism. And there is a certain impersonalism because sometimes we speak things in front of the deity which aren't supposed to be spoken. Sometimes we behave in certain ways in front of the deity that we aren't supposed to. Sometimes our temples become huge, huge places of extraordinary conflict. 
And the temple is the home of Krishna. It is his home. It is not our home. It is his home. So the standards that are to be maintained in the temple are based on the standards given in the Shastra because it is Krishna's house. If it is our home, Krishna makes a lot of adjustments. He is ready to accommodate himself based on whatever we offer. But when it is his home, he expects certain things to work because that's how he wants it to be. And what does he expect is what is being seen in Srimad Bhagavatam. Here is Krishna who is appearing in the form of the boar incarnation, who is actually hurt. <laughs> it's just fascinating to see that he's actually feeling a lot of hurt because this demon is insulting him. It's quite fascinating. And then you also find several other instances of extraordinarily personal dealings. But prema is to be experienced. Krishna prema is to be experienced before we can serve then because then we would know what Krishna's prema is for us. Yeah. Otherwise, we don't even have an understanding of his love. You see, it's almost as if we need to experience love for him to understand how much he loves us. It's a reciprocal circumstance. And because we don't have an understanding of how much he loves us, we don't have the ability to understand his needs so there isn't what we call the concept of surrender. We don't surrender to his needs. We practically are making arrangements based on our own abilities. We are not quite working on what will work for him because there isn't a concept of surrender. So the point I'm trying to make is when there's love, then there is an understanding of wanting to surrender to the senses of the beloved. So we want to basically surrender to the senses of Krishna. We want to basically give pleasure to the senses of Krishna. We want to basically situate ourselves in such a way that we can be sources of service, pleasure to Krishna's senses. That is our position. And we can't do that because we are not in love. And which is why our service can also be quite poor. So the first step is falling in love so that we understand how much he loves us. And as we understand how much he loves us, it would automatically provoke a sense of surrender uh, to help him, to basically to kind of um, serve him from all our faculties. So this is very important as a sequence. So, so one of the most important things for us to realize is the deity in the temple, the deity whom we worship is practically a means for us to come out of the impersonalism and to surrender because deity worship requires surrender. Uh, serious deity worship requires surrender because you need to make yourself fully available for the pleasure of the deity. So there has to be a certain kind of standard. There has to be different kinds of arrangements made. All of this would be centered around the deity. So when the temple standard is very high and the devotees in the temple are contributing to the standard wonderfully and powerfully, then one happens to see that the community is flourishing. When the temple standards are poor, where it's at the path, you know, whatever we do is fine, or we've created our own set of rules based on our own whim and fancy, then there are problems in the community. So you have one kind of problem or the other because, and sometimes the problems are insurmountable. The problems themselves become insurmountable because Krishna wants the devotee community to surrender. If the problems become insurmountable in life, they become insurmountable in the temple, the community has to surrender. So as a consequence, he just kind of creates an environment where he allows the idea of material nature to take over to such an extent that the covering and the conditioning that happens even in a temple environment is intense enough that the devotees start feeling a lot of conflict. So there's intense conflict. And all of this can be traced back to poor standards in deity worship. So it's very important to understand that you can practically commit seva aparad in an environment in one of our temples. And if it is consistent, it is accepted, it is not corrected, and it's prolonged for a long time, then you will see the community breaking down. Yeah, You will see all kinds of amazing, I would say things, phenomenon, which aren't supposed to happen will start happening. The contrary circumstances, when the deity worship is very powerful and there's a surrendered worship and the devotees who worship are chanting very nicely. And because if they chant very nicely, they're positioning themselves for service, then there is wonderful opportunity to engage in seva. There's wonderful opportunity to contribute and the community is growing as well. The community is growing. 
And this is these are contrary principles because the community is centered around the temple and the temple is centered around the needs of the deity. So everything is practically connected to the deity who is in the altar. So Sri Prabhupada practically arranged for us to give up our impersonalism and to become extraordinarily personal so that we could understand the emotions of Krishna through Srimad Bhagavatam and then offer our services, keeping those emotions in mind so that we become extraordinarily personal in serving. So we understand what is required, what is not required based on him and based on what he and Srimati Radharani prefer. So that's the whole point. But then every page of Srimad Bhagavatam brings these emotions out. We have all these emotions coming out in Bhagavatam from Krishna, which is quite astonishing. So let's read the chapter. I'm going to read the text, sorry, the translation. And then if there is a need, I'll comment on it. But for most part, it just makes for wonderful reading. Maitreya continued, the proud and falsely glorious Daitya paid little heed to the words of Varuna. O oh dear Vidura, he learned from Narada the whereabouts of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and hurriedly betook himself to the depths of the ocean. So Lord Varaha, seeing that Mother Earth had submerged to the bottom of the ocean, had come out of Lord Brahma's nostril. And then he practically took on the form of a boar. He came as a boar and then he practically grew in size to be as large as practically he could scale the different lokas. He became extraordinarily large. And then he plunged into the depths of the Garbhodaka ocean because the planet had actually sunk during the process of creation and destruction, etc. As he went deep within and as he was trying to bring the planet up, Hiranyaksha, hearing that Lord Varaha had gone down, practically went to the depths of the ocean. He practically jumped to the depth of the ocean. He saw there, this is verse two, he saw there the all-powerful personality of God in his boar incarnation, bearing the earth upward on the ends of his tusks and robbing him of his splendor with his reddish eyes. The demon laughed, oh, an amphibious beast. Text three, the demon addressed the Lord, O best of the demigods, dressed in the form of a bow, just hear me. This earth is entrusted to us the inhabitants of the lower regions, and you cannot take it from my presence and not be hurt by me. This is text four. You rascal. This is Hiranyaksha addressing Lord Baraha. You rascal. You have been nourished by our enemies to kill us, and you have killed some demons by remaining invisible. O oh fool, your power is only mystic, so today I shall enliven my kinsmen by killing you. Text five, the demon continued, when you fall dead with your skull smashed by the mace hurled by my arms, the demigods and sages who offer you oblations and sacrifice in devotional service will also automatically cease to exist like trees without roots. Text six, although the Lord was pained, this is, this is what I was referring to. Text six of uh, chapter uh, 18, Canto three. Although the Lord was pained by the shaft-like abusive words of the demon, he bore the pain. But seeing that the earth on the end of his tusks was frightened, he rose out of the water just as an elephant emerges with its female companion when assailed by an alligator. Lord Varaha, um, Lord Mahavishnu himself, he has three potencies. There is Shri, there is Bu, and then there is Neela. Yeah. So there is Narayana with Shri, Narayana with Bhu, there's Narayana with Leela, you know, sorry, uh, Neela. So these are three different potencies of the Lord. And the corresponding potencies in the material nature is Lakshmi, Saraswati, and uh, Kali, you know, the destructive aspect of the, the Shakti or the energy of Lord Shiva, Mother Parvati. Yeah. So these are three features in the material nature. But then in the spiritual sky, you have Mahavishnu. He has Sri, Bhu, and Neela. Now, Bhu is earth, but it is also the potency of Mother Saraswati, the potency of creation, 
because the earth is manifested. There are many, many souls with all kinds of fruitive desires and all kinds of manifestations of different bodies are created to facilitate those souls. So Mother Earth basically is facilitating the process of creation. So this is Bu. So normally Lord Varaha is addressed as Bu Varaha. Yeah. Just as we say, for example, the Lord's uh, different potencies, he's preceded or you know, there's a prefix. In this case, it is Bu Varaha. Bu Varaha, very specifically, the deity would see, you would see carrying the Mother Earth on top of his tusks. Sometimes Bu is also represented as a consort where she is seated on the lap of Lord Varaha in some temples. You know, those deities also are seen. So this is basically Bu. So the Shastra Puranas extol him, they practically call upon him as Bu Varaha. So it is Bu Varaha, Bu Pataye. Bu Pataye, Bu Varaha. Bu Pataye essentially is to refer to the husband or the master of Bu. Bu Pataye, Bu Varaha. So this is all terms which are associated with Lord Varaha. And he is Bu Varaha. And this, he practically represents the potency of creation. He's practically protecting the creation. And as a consequence, he is allowing Lord Brahma to carry out his duties. That is what he does. So here we see that he actually saw that Mother Earth, Bu, whom he was carrying, was actually agitated because of the harsh words coming from Hiranyaksha. And he also saw that there was agitation in her overall because of the, uh, the idea that there was going to be a conflict. So he quickly wanted to place Mother Earth on top of the water. So he brings Mother Earth on top of the water and through his potency, he helps Mother Earth remain afloat. So she is on top of the water, but she doesn't sink because by the potency of Lord Varaha, she is practically able to stay afloat. And then he plunges back again to take the fight to Hiranyaksha. The demon who had golden hair on his head and fearful tusks gave chase to the Lord while he was rising from the water, even as an alligator would chase an elephant. Roaring like thunder, he said, are you not ashamed of running away before a challenging adversary? There's nothing reproachable for shameless creatures. So interesting to see that Hiranyaksha was a blonde. Yeah? <laughs> Hiranyaksha was a blonde. Text 8. The the Lord placed the earth within his sight on the surface of the water and transferred to her his own energy in the form of the ability to float on the water. While the enemy stood looking on, Brahma, the creator of the universe, extolled the Lord and the other demigods rained flowers on him. Because that is why he appeared. He appeared to save Mother Earth from the bottom of the ocean. So he placed her back. Yeah? Now, a very powerful phenomenon and is a very powerful prayer, is in this particular uh, role of picking up Mother Earth and allowing the process of creation to continue and bringing her to the surface of the ocean and then not preventing her from sinking so that the process of creation could continue. Worshipping Lord Varaha and practically chanting and reading all of this during pregnancy is a very powerful antidote for safe pregnancies. Safe pregnancies can occur when one meditates on Lord Varaha based on this particular his theme. And it is a very, very powerful, very, very powerful antidote if there are complicated pregnancies. I have personally recommended mantras associated with Lord Varaha to help mothers who are expecting, who are expecting some complications. And they have somewhat, you know, come out um, by the blessings of Lord Varaha. They have been able to deliver their children quite comfortably, you know, with, with, or, you know, with being protected. So this is basically a very powerful antidote for complicated pregnancies because he's practically fighting to ensure that the process of creation is continuing. And he's practically bringing the planet and placing the planet back on top. The demon who had a wealth of ornaments, bangles and beautiful golden armor on his body chased the Lord from behind with a great mace. The Lord tolerated his piercing ill words, but in order to reply to him, he expressed his terrible anger. The personality of God had said, indeed, we are creatures of the jungle 
and we're searching after hunting dogs like you. One who is freed from the entanglement of death has no fear from the loose talk in which you're indulging, for you are bound up by the laws of death. Text 11. Certainly, we have stolen the charge of the inhabitants of Rasatala and have lost all shame. Although bitten by your powerful maze, I shall stay here in the water for some time, because having created enmity with a powerful enemy, I have no place to go. This is also an important lesson. When you have a very, very powerful enemy, then the enmity has to be resolved. It has to end. Otherwise, there would be constant disturbances. This is practically a statement where he's saying, that now there is enmity with someone who is very powerful. So if I just leave him wherever he is, he's going to continuously cause challenges. It has to end. So Krishna has the same objective. He's practically saying, you know, I have to stay here now. I have to resolve this issue because if I were to move away, you will simply continue following me. You will cause disturbances wherever I go. You will disturb those who are associated with me. It is better for me to just end this. You are supposed to be the commander of many foot soldiers, and now you take prompt steps to overthrow us. Give up all your foolish talk and wipe out the cares of your kith and kin by staying, slaying us. One may be proud, yet he does not deserve a seat in an assembly if he fails to fulfill his promised word. Sri Maitreya said, the demon being thus challenged by the personality of God, it became angry and agitated and trembled in anger like a challenged cobra. Hissing indignantly, all his senses shaken by wrath, the demon quickly sprang upon the Lord and dealt him a blow with his powerful mace. The Lord, however, by moving slightly aside, dodged the violent mace blow aimed at his breast by the enemy, just as an accomplished yogi would elude death. The personality of God now exhibited his anger and rushed to meet the demon who bit his lip in rage took up his mace again and began to repeatedly brandish it about. Then with his mace, the Lord stuck the enemy on the right of his bro. But since the demon was expert in fighting, O gentle Vidura, he protected himself by a maneuver of his own mace. So it's quite fascinating to see that Hiranyaksha actually had such prowess that he could escape the Lord's um, wrath. He could escape the blows of the Lord. Yeah, this is the time factor. Krishna is a time factor. If someone could practically be deft enough to move away and so on, that is also the potency of Krishna. He's practically empowered this demon to give a good fight. In this way, the demon Hariyaksha and the Lord, the personality of God, stuck each other with the huge maces, each enraged and seeking his own victory. Um, he is also called Hariyaksha, um, but I do not know the extended explanation for why. So I'm going to leave it there. But Srimad Bhagavatam here, this verse says, Hariyaksha is another name for Hiranyaksha. There was keen rivalry between the two combatants. Both had sustained injuries on their bodies from blows of each other's pointed maces. And each grew more and more enraged at the smell of blood on, on his person. In their eagerness to win, they performed maneuvers of various kinds and their contest looked like an encounter between two forceful bulls for the sake of a cow. O descendant of Kuru, Brahma, the most independent demigod of the universe, accompanied by his followers, came to see the terrible fight for the sake of the world between the demon and the personality of God, who appeared in the form of a boar. After arriving at the place of combat, Brahma, the leader of thousands of sages and transcendentalists, saw the demon who had attained such unprecedented power that no one could fight with them. Brahma then addressed Narayana, who was assuming the form of a boar for the first time. Lord Brahma said, my dear Lord, this demon has proved to be a constant pinprick to the demigods, the brahmanas, the cows, and the innocent persons who are spotless and always dependent upon worshiping your lotus feet. He has become a source of fear by unnecessarily harassing them. Since he has attained a boon from me, he has become a demon always searching for a proper combatant, wandering all over the universe for this infamous purpose. Now, one moment. Lord Brahma continued, my dear Lord, there's no need to play with this serpentine demon who is always very skilled in conjuring tricks and is arrogant, self-sufficient and most wicked. 
And Brahma continued, my dear Lord, you're infallible. Please kill this sinful demon before the demoniac hour arrives. And he presents another formidable approach favorable to him. You can kill him by your internal potency without doubt. My Lord, the darkest evening which covers the world is fast approaching. Since you are the soul of all souls, kindly kill him and win victory for the demigods. The auspicious period known as Abhijit, which is most opportune for victory, commenced at midday and has all but passed. Therefore, in the interest of your friends, please dispose of this formidable foe quickly. Now, it is quite fascinating to see that even when there's Leela and you have Lord Nasimadev and you have Lord Varaha fighting with the demon, there is Vidhi within the material universe. So when things should be done. So the demons can become powerful and extraordinarily powerful based on certain hours. The Vaishnavas are very powerful during a certain hour. So the Abhijit is the midday part. So if you divide the sunrise and the sunset and into divided into two, the exact midpoint is called the Abhijit Muhurta. So that particular Muhurta is very powerful for the purpose of auspicious activities. Even if there are inauspicious patterns in the sky, that particular time frame is called Hari Muhurta. So the Lord is fully manifest then. So that is what Lord Brahma is referring to. He's saying that the auspicious time of Abhijit has passed and has all but passed. Now you need to take care of this because an inauspicious hour is arising. So it's fascinating to see that Krishna has to operate within the rules of the universe. And Lord Brahma is practically giving him the rules of, you know, basically the auspicious, inauspicious times. So we want to also understand that as devotees, we are also subject to this to, some, to a large extent. So the point I'm trying to make here is you can see this during Jiva Goswami Path's sending of books to Bengal through Sinivas Acharya and uh, Narottam Das Thakur. It is said that Srila Jiva Goswami look for an auspicious hour to send. Uh, you can see the warnings given by Rupa Goswami Pad to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu saying that he should not travel with a large group because he is being noticed. So what we are seeing is in Shastra and in the behavior of our predecessor Acharyas that there's a lot of care that is being taken in terms of rules and regulations within the material universe. So if there is an opportunity to use rules and apply rules, we should as well. We shouldn't neglect those because they exist for a purpose. And Krishna is being encouraged by Lord Brahma to follow those rules as well. He's practically telling him that Lord Varaha is being encouraged. Lord Varaha is being told that the auspicious hour has passed. And then the inauspicious hour is coming, which means based on the rules of the material world, the demons are going to become very powerful. So it's interesting to see that even, even during Leela, they are playing by rules of the material universe and they have to pick auspicious versus inauspicious hours because even for the Lord, <laughs> fascinating to see, even for the Lord to operate, they have to pick auspicious, inauspicious hours. Bhishma Dev was waiting for Uttarayana, for the sun to move into the northern coast before leaving his body. So you see that a lot of these very accomplished personalities in Shastra, they practically were following rules of the material universe. They were very strict. They were not dependent fully on the rules for their results. They were not dependent on anything. They practically gave and accepted the results of their work as given by Krishna. But what is seen is that there was a strict adherence to rules of the material nature, and which is also being seen here. Where Lord Brahma is basically talking about auspicious versus inauspicious in terms of helping the demons versus helping the Lord. So that is very, I would say, quite significant. The demon, luckily for us, has come of his own accord to you. His death ordained by you, therefore exhibiting your ways, kill him in the duel and establish the worlds in peace. So that's the last verse of this chapter. Next week, we will continue with chapter 19. So we noticed in this chapter, some of the most important aspects of this chapter was the fact that Krishna is so personal. He has emotions. He is, remembers his devotees. He's dealing with us very emotionally. Even when the devotee is extraordinarily conditioned, and many of us are, most of us are, Krishna still is basically dealing with us with all kinds of wonderful emotions. So here we notice that Parahadev is dealing with Hiranyaksha, who is extraordinarily conditioned. 
He has a demoniac consciousness. But Varahadev basically remembers that this is my servant and he is hurt by the words of Hiranyaksha because of this attachment to his servants. Krishna can't give up attachments. The Lord Varaha, which is Krishna, you, he can't give up attachments. He can't give up attachments to his servants, to the Vaishnavas. He becomes theirs. He, you know, he practically becomes the Vaishnavas' property. And as a consequence, he's not able to give up that particular relationship. Even though the covering of that personality is demoniac, Krishna doesn't want to forego the relationship. He's actually experiencing emotions. So it's fascinating to see how personal this whole exchange is. And Rash, Srimad Bhagavatam is bringing all of this out so that it could purify our sense of our contact with Krishna. So the next time we go to the temple, we are observing a very personal, I would say, um, relationship. We are basically moving forward and understanding him through a personal view, not an impersonal view. So it's very important for us. So I'll stop here and see if you have any questions. Okay, there seems to be something on chat. I'm just going to see. Yeah, the two sons of Diti were both killed by the Lord, but separately by two different incarnations, Raha and Nasimha. Was there only a short time gap between these two appearances of the Lord? Um, apparently not. Apparently not. Yeah, apparently not. Um, because it is said, for example, that Prahalat Maharaj was instructed in the womb of his mother for 10,000 years. Yeah. Yeah. Mother Diti was holding on to the pregnancy for 100 yeah. years. So yeah. it seems to be a completely different scale. Uh, sure. yeah. Thank you. Really. Yeah. Is there any other question? Yeah, Martha. Hare Krishna, Prabhupada. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Yeah, so I just, you know, uh, you mentioned that we first need to get the love and then we surrender and then we do the service. If this order happens like one after the other, it can happen like uh, simultaneously. So my question is mainly I'm doing some services now, but I don't think I have a pure love or no pure surrender to Krishna. So I just want to understand how can I understand this? Yeah, you need, we are, our position is that we are purifying our senses uh, by engaging in us uh, in service, as our senses become purified, and we basically are free of the influence of the material nature, and our conditioning is reduced. We improve upon ourselves. We improve upon our consciousness to understand the relationship. You see, for us to actually love someone, we need to know what the relationship is. And while we perform sadhana bhakti. We are being purified by coming in touch with Krishna's limbs. And by coming in touch with Krishna, we are purified. And when we become purified, we practically have an understanding of our relationship with him, our sambandha. Then once the relationship is understood, further service is done, but with a new understanding of the relationship. And then as it concentrates and the service improves, and then there is a great deal of exchange, then there are loving sentiments that are experienced in the heart of the devotee. Emotions are experienced. So until then, we continue to serve and we surrender to the process of purification of sadhana bhakti and basically continue to serve. And slowly, steadily, gradually, we would reach the position of being able to serve uh, in love. Thank you, Prabhupada. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, Prabhuji, I have one more question for the last class. Can I ask, Prabhuji? Yeah, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically, I think uh, I remember you mentioning uh, Jaya, Vijaya is basically in the border of the material world. They are not in the spiritual world. So uh, when uh, these uh, four Kumaras going, they crossed the six gates of Vaikuntha, right? They were stopped at the seventh gate. So you mm -hmm. mean all these seven gates are in the border of the material world? Yes, one can assume that one has to be, I think the more fundamental assumption that we want to make 
is that one has to be under the influence of material nature to go against the desires of Krishna. Yeah? So since Jaya and Vijaya went against the nature of Krishna, the desires of Krishna, they had to be in touch with material nature. How can one be in touch with material nature is only if you are tatasta, which means you are in Vaikuntha, but then you're also capable of coming in touch at some level. So they are in the border. Yeah. So one has to understand that. How many gates were crossed? How many gates were basically within the material sky? How many were in the spiritual sky? We do not know. But then their consciousness could have already been experienced or rather could have been influenced by material nature. Does it make sense? They, we don't have to assume that they're only in that particular gate always. They could have, okay, been, also, could have been influenced as well. That's the point. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Okay, now there's a question here on chat. Uh, we were discussing the pregnancy of Diti in a Birmingham Srimad Bhagavatam class this week. It seems as though she was punished merely because the conception was at an inauspicious time, a time when the ghosts and the evil spirits move around. What time of day or night are ghosts and evil spirits moving around? Are there any other actions that are forbidden during such inauspicious times? In reality, that is not the particular situation that occurs. In reality, it was a sandhi. It's a junction of time. So there is a morning junction of time, which is the sunrise. Then there is high noon. And then there is sunset. So the period of time between these junctions of time are considered to be inauspicious, more so in the evening where there is a particular time frame when the day shifts into the night. And during that particular time frame, that particular junction of time is dominated by or ruled by the manifestation of Krishna as Lord Shiva. In the afternoon, he appears as Vishnu. Then in the morning, it is called Brahma Muhurta. Brahma Muhurta, early in the morning, is because Lord Brahma, who wants to engage in the activity of creation, wants to be situated in the mode of goodness. Because if he is situated in the mode of goodness, then he can engage in the activity of creation without passion overcoming him. In the afternoon, it is Abhijit Muhurta, Hari Muhurta, which is 12 noon, that is ascribed to Vishnu. Because whatever has been created by Lord Brahma in the preceding six hours have to be maintained. So Lord Vishnu practically appears and he maintains that particular creation during that time. In the evening, Lord Shiva appears and it is considered to be a time when whatever needs to be destroyed will be destroyed. So it is practically whatever was earned, whatever was created is actually subdued, destroyed in the evening. And that is the beginning of that hour. So when Lord Shiva appears, he is accompanied by his followers. And the followers themselves are spirits, they are ghosts, etc. So that's why there is an association of spirits and ghosts, etc. in the evening. But what is more important is the fact that she actually committed the offense of not obeying her husband. She interrupted his worship. He had just had a bath and he was ready to offer oblations into the fire at the evening juncture. She practically interrupted his engagement in worship at that point in time and became subjected to anger of the husband. So the husband was agitated. He was angry because he was disturbed. And then Mother Diti was already in the grip of lust. And along with this, there was this particular inauspicious hour, which is where Lord Shiva practically is passing on the sky. And during the time, you're supposed to engage in spiritual work, in spiritual activity, not in this particular activity of procreation, which in, in other words, you're not supposed to engage in activities which especially are not, um, you know, are stopping the performance of you know, the daily rituals which was happening in this particular situation. Yeah. So there's a big difference between um, saying that it is inauspicious because of ghosts and evil spirits. It is inauspicious because she, Kashyapa was stopped from offering oblations. So the, and there was, she disobeyed him, even though he was constantly 
trying to pacify her. So that created anger in the mind of Kashyapa. And then she were already in a situation which was quite weak. And then added to that was the passing of Lord Rudra, Rudra in the sky. So it was all a combination, I would say. Hare Krishna. Uh, one moment. Uh, yes, Prabhu. Yes. Uh, Prabhu, so why could not the husband uh, refuse at that time? Why did he have to allow... Notice, he could have just told his wife, no, this is inauspicious, and no is no, but why did he consent? Well, he did not... He, he the, the rules are that when there's such a demand, you are supposed to accept. Yeah? So he tried his very best to pacify. In fact... There's a whole bunch of verses that are dedicated to Kashyapa Muni praising Mother Diti because praise is a subtle form of sexuality because when sexuality manifests itself in a subtle form, it develops into in the person a deep desire for recognition, a deep desire for accomplishment, and so on and so forth. So he is seen praising Mother Diti and extolling her, kind of positioning her and giving her a lot of encouragement. But that doesn't really work. And then he finally subscribes to basically, uh, you know, uh, what I would call as um, accepting the circumstance because he is also a seer. So he is able to see that this particular circumstance is ordained by the time factor. So he tried his very best, but he's also able to see that this is practically the future. It's practically what he has to agree to. So he subjects, subjects himself to that particular circumstance. So it doesn't mean that he wasn't affected by her, um, what I would call as um, her condition. He was also affected, So which means that he was also overpowered in certain ways. And there was also a situation which was particularly weak because of the inauspicious of her. And then there was a circumstance where he really tried very hard to stop her, but couldn't. So then he agrees because you know, he doesn't want to basically allow this to continue because it is not recommended by Shastra to allow that to continue. Uh, you know, a situation such as that. So all of these conditions apply. Okay, so I just want to read the remaining questions. Um, we have Thanksgiving retreat at the temple this weekend. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I will. I will reply to you. Yeah. Sure. Is there any other question or comment that I could address? Okay, I think we'll end today's session and then we'll meet again the following week. So I wish you all the very best for the future week. We'll connect again and we'll do the next chapter, which is chapter 19, where Hiranyaksha is slain. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.